We can be dream makers, nurturing, compassionate. Nosotros podemos ser más unidos. We can be anything. I'm Grant Oliphant. This is We Can Be. Our guest today is smart beyond words, empathetic and kind, and stands out among roboticists for the projects he works on, most notably not Department of Defense projects. Dr. Ilan Norbosch is professor of robotics at the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University and heads Create Lab, a technology breeding ground that partners with communities to empower citizens to chart their technology future and improve their quality of life in a myriad of ways. He is a celebrated author, worldwide leader in the realm of artificial intelligence, and keeps his focus on robotics that benefit all of us. Ilan Orbosch, welcome to We Can Be. It's a pleasure to be with you, Grant. So I sometimes struggle to describe exactly what it is you do, and I've just made a passing attempt at the, in the introduction. But why don't you, in your own words, describe what it is you do? I think what I do is fundamentally about empowerment. I have over the course of the 22 years at Carnegie Mellon, gradually assembled a team of people who've made it their decision for career, for life, to stick around, be underpaid compared to what they could make at Uber or Google or Apple, and basically try and use technology specifically for social good all the time, every day of the week. And so what I do is logistically trying to make that freedom of action for them possible, which means deal with the bureaucracy, it means deal with funding, and empower them to do the visioning so that every one of them feels like they're actually forging a new kind of pathway for how a technologist can influence the world in, an, in a direct pro-social positive way. Right now, when you hear people talk about artificial intelligence and advanced computing and what's happening in the technology world, the discussion is often about, you know, our robot future, are we going to be ruled by robots or is artificial intelligence going to take over the planet? You have a very distinct philosophy about this technology serving the interests of society. You had done an exhibit using that technology, advanced computing power, to look at the patterns of refugees as they have moved around the globe in the past many years. I'm curious, how do you choose your projects and what determines pro-social for you? It's a really interesting and nuanced question, actually. The fundamental challenge we have in the world of AI and robotics is that the way projects are chosen today, the way they're funded and the way they're actualized, in fact, reinforces hegemonic power structures in society. It's the company that innovates and funds the AI research and creates new AI that in fact uses it for marginal profit gain, to create behavioral analytics tools that inform them of the behavior of consumers in such a way that they can manipulate the behavior of consumers. So what we do is exactly the opposite of that. We look at conditions in society where there are existing hegemonic power structures, whether with corporation or with government. And we consider the question, is there a way in which technology can take the subaltern, can take those who are actually underneath power structures and invert their power relationship? It's basically, we want the tail to wag the dog. We want people, the citizenry, who in fact elect public officials and through purchasing elects corporate governors, we want that citizenry to have a newfound power through technology. SPAC is an air sensor that Create Lab initially made available at the Carnegie Library in Pittsburgh for residents to bring into their homes and analyze the air they breathe. As Illa said recently, this is the air quality you can actually do something about if you know that a hazard even exists. That's why it's so important that people of all income levels have access to a sensor such as SPEC. That sensor is now available in libraries all around the country, thanks to Illa and his team's work. We became really interested in the question of citizen science and citizen engagement with technology years ago. The question was, back to the power relationship issue, is it possible for technology to turn citizens into citizen scientists, but to elevate their standing in decision-making systems so that what they say, what they measure, what they feel actually matters more for decision-making? And we had a beautiful example here that 
we worked on, and of course these take years to do because they're really about social science, not technology. And it was around Shenango. Illa shared this story with me during our podcast recording and with a crowd of nearly 700 people at P4 2018. It is a hopeful account of a community using data to affect positive change in their environment. We started working with folks in uh, Avalon and Ben Avon, the communities near Neville Island, when the Shenango Coke factory was making Coke there a couple years ago. They describe sweeping soot out of their porches every morning. They describe keeping their windows shut at night when it was hot and humid, because if you open it, the stench will keep you awake. And they describe calling the health department and saying, it stinks, do something about it. We think it's that Coke factory right there. And the health department is saying, well, could be the Coke factory, or maybe it's the paint factory. So since we don't know who it is, we don't know who to find, so we won't find anybody. Nice answer. Well, that community, Ben Avon and Avalon that I talked about, Create Lab went out and worked with them. They installed cameras in their attic windows, facing onto the, fl- the plant that was giving off illegal plumes of pollution. And then they took those camera inputs and conjoined them with smell reports and with federal air quality sensors and wind direction sensors. And they did this not for a day, not for a week, not for a month, but for a whole year. And they did this and did this until they had ridiculous amounts, thousands of hours of evidence showing in a way that's undeniable the pollution that's illegal coming off the plant. So now you can connect the dots and create a story online as a community member that says, check this out, check this out. Last night there was an inversion layer. Look at the wind direction. Look how all the people in this area reported bad smell. And well, guess what? There's an asthma case. And here's the EPA monitors. The own federal sensors agreed with our assessment. Then they invited the division coordinator for the EPA to to Shenango, to Neville Island. They got up in front of him and showed their results. We were in the audience watching and smiling. They showed thousands of images of illegal plumes, and he sat there and looked at them. And then he finally got up and said, this is not acceptable. A month and a half later, the plant was closed. Often this work leads you to work with populations that are at a disadvantage in some respect in terms of competing with the global or local economy. In one case, you've done work in Uganda. Could you say something about that? I can. This is an interesting story because it started with a Super Bowl ad. You know, it started with Toyota saying, we want uh, people around the country to invent a device for good using the bits and pieces in a Prius. <laughs> and then they wanted people to come up with an idea, and they were going to take the 10 or 15 winning ideas, send them to Carnegie Mellon, and have the Create Lab build prototypes of those ideas and film it. And lo and behold, one of the ideas was actually gobsmackingly good. It was to take a solar panel from a Prius, put it on the roof in a one-room house in rural part of Africa, where you have a little fire in the corner of the house indoors, and use that solar panel to drive a simple, cheap fan extractor like you might have in a computer and pull the smoke out of that room. And then that, in addition, would create negative pressure so then you get some clean air filtering in from under the doorway. We built one here, but we were kind of blown away by how well it worked in a little lean-to that we built until the police took it away here in Pittsburgh. The police took it away. Well, we were making fires inside Uh, of a (laughs) lean-to next to a garage. And it got reported. (laughs) You have to do things in the name of science. Absolutely. So then we flew to Uganda and we tried it. We took three copies to Uganda. Then we took a few more. I have to explain, you know, when you live in a one-room house, you sleep on the floor, your whole family sleeps on the floor, you cook in the same room, the children tend the fire. They have nothing. They don't own anything. We had a family give us their chicken. That's how much they appreciated getting rid of the smoke. So the the impact you can have with the simplest of technology like that was remarkable. The interesting part was there were, you know, Clinton Global Initiative stoves all over the place there on the streets, not being used. Why? Because they take coal. Nobody has coal. So again, anthropology matters. Ethnography matters. You have to think about the people and solve the solution in a way that actually works for them. Ironically, Toyota supported the building of a prototype, but that was the end game for them. They just wanted an ad. The challenge since then for yours had been to find funding to continue that effort. And in fact, we did a a Kickstarter-like campaign on on social media 
And then that, in turn, led to a little bit of funding from Heinz. And those two things combined allowed us to go back and put dozens of these into the entire village just this summer. The piece about the Clinton Global Initiative stove is a story you hear over and over and over again in philanthropy about the well-intentioned use of technology to solve a social problem that when somebody goes back and checks later, it turns out not to have solved the problem at all. As a lesson for people involved in social change, technology development, or philanthropy, what is it that we miss that could lead a, somebody to think a coal-fired stove is a good solution for people who don't have coal? We um, actually are bigots. We don't trust indigenous know-how. What we do when we go into a community is we think of ourselves as advanced somehow over them, just because we happen to know how to type on a computer or we have an iPhone. And so we decide that our job is to look at their problem and come up with a solution and then deliver it to them, shrink-wrapped. And they have the wisdom to tell us what's wrong with our solution. And they have all the intelligence in the world to understand our proposed solution and criticize it well before we go down that path. So fundamentally, we need to get off our high horse. We need to team. It's called participatory design. We have to team with the community and together design solutions with that community because they will have wisdom that we cannot possibly attain. We also have to give ourselves years to solve the problem. This idea that you go in and solve any problem in a few months is nonsense. How did you come by this robust sense of social justice? In a bad way. <sighs> I was uh, an immigrant, and I came to America to a very tiny town called Platte City, Missouri, which is a little farm town of a few hundred people. And it was at first idyllic because everybody knows your name. And that works until something goes wrong. And that something going wrong in my case was called the Iranian hostage crisis. Because when that happened, the people that are your purported friends in school, they make fun of you, they beat you up every day, and you realize the degree of bigotry that's around you. Because what did I have to do with the hostage crisis? I'm a nine-year-old, I'm a 10-year-old. Mm. That's the milieu in which I grew up that I think made me probably hyper-aware of bigotry in various forms. Then what happened is in college, as I worked on my degrees, I was doing some robotics work, and my professor said, we have the, the Navy coming in for a demo. Can you demo a, a tank that fires on its own? And ironically, as he said this, I think we were in the second Gulf War or the first Gulf War. I was busy running demonstrations on the streets. So I'm looking at my professor tell me to demonstrate something to the Navy about firing tanks, and I'm busy running anti-war demonstrations. I can't do this. What, I mean, I was a registered pacifist with the, <laughs> with the Selective Service. So... I, I got the guts finally to tell him no. And he said, oh, that's fine. Then why don't you work on education instead? And he gave me a new robot. And that floored me. What, what happened in that moment is that that professor, Mike Genezareth at Stanford, decided that my ethical stance mattered more than his funding relationship and that he was going to support it by giving me a new path altogether. That's freedom. It's like somebody took the handcuffs off of me that I didn't know that were there, and I never thought they'd come off. And so when I got to Carnegie Mellon, it was just dotted, dotted lines from there to do the exact same thing for people at Carnegie Mellon. Oh, with the top 16 times running in the transplant space. Is it true that Herbie the love bug played a role somewhere in there? Yes, it's true. Uh, <laughs> you have done good research. Um, <laughs> my family was off to go see Herbie the love bug, um, and it was sold out and I was extremely demoralized as a small kid. And the neighboring theater was playing this thing that nobody had heard about called Star Wars. So we just went there, and I remember walking in in tears because I was so unhappy about not seeing Herbie. And then I remember also walking out in a daze. Did I just see that? Is that, did that happen? <laughs> and back then there were no protagonist robots in our world. There were no C-3PO's and R2-D2's. This whole idea, of science fiction future, I mean, the best we had done was kind of the ballet of 2001. So Star Wars reinvigorated this idea of robots that work hand in hand with people to solve problems. And that definitively set me out on a desire to understand electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and computer science. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. 
Artificial intelligence is usually defined as the branch of computer science that deal with writing computer programs that can solve problems creatively. I like to imagine myself a bit like an aurora borealis. Mostly, though, I am just Alexa. The enemies of liberal democracy will succeed in part by hacking our emotions. Actually, the greatest vulnerability that we have as a political system is the opportunity that we've created for people to hack into our emotional systems and drive how we think. It is having an interesting effect on our relationship with data and information, however, and it seems as though we're dividing into camps of whether we believe certain things or not based on whether it affirms our pre-existing beliefs. When you watch a YouTube video, then it suggests new videos to you. If you keep clicking through the suggested videos, on average what happens is you see more and more polarized content that takes you to one extreme, depending on where you started. And so over the course of the echo chamber that you're playing for yourself, you end up extremal. And it's designed that way because that's what keeps you going. If you watch something that's a little bit liberal, but I position something to you next that's even more liberal, you're likelier to click on it than if I proposition to you something more centered. Mm. Same thing for right wing. How do we counteract behavioral analytics? How do we counteract losing democracy? Because we're not making a choice. We're becoming a remote control agent. I believe it all boils down to the fact that our citizens, our educators, our lawmakers, and our corporate governors need what I call AI fluency. They need something they don't have today at all, which is what the boundary conditions of AI are. What is computational bias? How is it that computer systems actually introduce bias and racism into systems? There's no such thing as an intelligent machine. That's a, a fantasy uh, that's used to manipulate people who will then accept direction from the machine. Jaron Zeppelinier is an American computer philosophy writer, computer scientist, visual artist, and composer of classical music. Unfortunately, that means that those who believe in technology the most are using it the worst. The problem is more that we all fool ourselves whether it's the elite or not. I think we all tend to believe that the technology will somehow do something for us when ultimately it's only our own responsibility and very, very difficult politics and compromise that can create any betterment. Does society have the appropriate level of concern about the way in which artificial intelligence and robotics and the connectivity of everything are creeping into our lives more and more? Is, the, is, is this an alarming trend, a positive trend, or is that story yet to be written? There are absolutely positive stories about AI. So I'm going to say a very negative thing, but I want to start by <laughs> explaining that there's plenty of good news. I'll give you a simple Pittsburgh example. East Liberty, the light system, is now controlled by a fantastic machine learning optimization system that looks at the cars, looks at the pedestrians, and schedules the green lights and red lights around Target and Home Depot to minimize idle time in the cars. So you make the air cleaner, people travel more quickly, and even pedestrians get to walk faster. So that's an AI system that's doing just an outstanding job at improving society. Another example comes out of machine learning at Carnegie Mellon, looks at the purchasing habits of people across the country in drugstores and can use this to very quickly find the onset of pandemics in the U.S. before the hospitals have a clue, before the CDC has a clue. Mm. So that's fantastic in terms of global health welfare. So AI can be very smart and analytic and solve optimization problems better than us. But we keep making this interesting mistake where we use AI to alienate ourselves from ourselves. We replace people with AI. So we'll take Google now and say, hey, why don't we set it up so that when I'm running late for an appointment, it texts Grant and says, hey, Grant, I'm going to run 10 minutes late automatically. But when you start doing that, when you start having AI systems represent us and make decisions on the part of individual humans, then you start subtracting agency from individual humans. And the problem is our dignity, our sense of self-worth is actually coiled up into our own sense of agency quite tightly. And we don't know how to divorce those effectively and still stay, stay whole and sane. So that's something society does not talk about, is the ways in which AI can help society among societal problems. But what are the ways in which by giving AI agency over personal decisions, we start to actually subjugate ourselves to decision-making by autonomous systems? 
this, by the way, is one of the reasons I'm also fairly involved in the whole community movement to say that AI shouldn't make decisions about killing people. So that in war, even if you have highly robotic equipment, humans should be making decisions as significant as the taking of life. I heard a horrible term the other day to refer to this, uh, slaughter bots, that, um, that folks like you are fighting to prevent those from being brought into existence. And ironically, it's sort of too late. Because if you look at a lot of the complex cruise missiles and other devices we have, they're designed to respond with a fact faster reaction time than humans have so that they can respond and shoot something down. And even though technically people have veto power and they can stop them, nobody can behave that quickly to stop them. To what extent this train has already left the station is an interesting question. I was recently at a gathering of technologists at a national conference, and each and every single one seemed to be hell-bent on inventing the next better technological agent. So I find Illa's reference to human agency interesting, because the robotics and artificial intelligence community often seem intent on building new things that will think and do better than humans. In other words, take away our agency. The debate that was taking place at that conference ties exactly into what we're talking about here. When will we cross the threshold when even the role of managers and programmers and artists will be subsumed by artificial intelligence? What is the role of humanity in the future that this community of folks you're a part of is trying to invent? So indeed, they are dreaming of a superhuman intelligence, AGI, artificial mm -hmm. general intelligence. And when you deep dive with them uh, into the Lanier's or the Ray Kurzweil's of the world and, and what they intend, what's interesting is the boundary for them for what a, an, an artificial general intelligence can do is never ending. It keeps doing more. It is not just uh, our accounting and our taxes and our war and our government and our judging because they're good judges because they're unbiased. It's our art. It's our music. And then it's our art critic and it's our music critic. And before long, you've set up a society in which you're replacing every solitary job of a human with that thing, all in the service of what? Giving humans the free time to do, wait, you just took away everything we have the free time to do. <laughs> right. And what's more, some of us get our dignity from the work we do, whatever that work may be. I love doing pottery. I have a kick wheel. The last thing I want is a robot to use my kick wheel. That would be a disaster for me, but it would be much more productive. <laughs> so... Part of it is, is that fundamentally they seem to be stuck with what we call techno-optimism, the idea that technology will solve our problems. And I've had deep discussions with folks on this where we'll sit down and I'll say, well, we have a fundamental food problem. I mean, you look at 9, 10 billion people, that's not possible to feed that many people with the diet we have today. And they'll say, we just need faster computers. And I'll, I'll go say, what? And they go, well, when the computers are faster, Ela, they will figure out how to solve the food problem. And then I'll say, okay, but when you say faster computer, the power source you need to speed that computer along uses massive amounts of power, and that's carbon in the air. Too much carbon. Climate problem. And they'll say, no, 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 the faster computer will solve the battery problem. They're going to invent new batteries. I'll say, really? They're going to solve all the problems. And no matter what problem I give you, if you're a pure techno-optimist, you'll say, you don't get it, Ela. Yeah. The computer will solve that problem. We just have to make a better computer, and it'll solve all those problems. The irony in this is the reality that we face is not an existential threat with these computers becoming superhuman. They're so far from superhuman, it's laughable. There's a paper that just came out on a stop sign. It's just a regular red stop sign. Three pieces of black duct tape, little pieces, you put on the stop sign. To you and me, it looks like a stop sign. To all the computers that look at stop signs on the road for self-driving cars, it looks like a 45 mile per hour speed limit sign. The funny part about computers is they're not human, they're alien. And because they're alien intelligences, the mistakes they make are completely alien too. They have nothing to do with the way we behave. Another fun example, you show a, an AI system a picture of some kids playing frisbee on the grass, and it writes a sentence for you explaining the picture. It says, these are children playing frisbee on the grass. So you read that sentence and you go, wow, that computer is so smart, it knows what's going on, awesome. And then you say, actually, it's doing statistics on all those words and sticking them together like that because it's seen that sentence online in concert with pictures that look similar to this picture. That's what it's actually doing. In fact, let's try it out. So you ask the computer, 
Can a six-month-old play frisbee? Sorry, I'm not sure about that. I don't know, is its answer. You can ask it, are frisbees edible? I don't know that one. I don't know. How far do they fly? Sorry. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't know anything about playing frisbee. It doesn't even know what a frisbee is. And yet, to us, it looks intelligent. So the thing that we need to grapple with is that AI can do great things for us, but it's not really artificial intelligence. It's alien intelligence. And the ways it makes mistakes will always be alien to us. Doesn't that make it incredibly dangerous? Especially if you put it in charge of something like our power infrastructure or our judging system. And yet the techno-optimists, and I heard more than a few, all seem to say, well, we'll figure out the social and moral implications when we get there. We just have to be smarter. But the technology is coming. We just have to be smarter. But I never heard one suggestion as to how we be smarter. So what can we do to begin preparing the technological future to have a recognition of the social and moral implications? So first of all, we have to recognize that innovation does not come from technologists. It comes from, in the best case, an interface between technologists, social scientists, consumers, and humanitarians. We need the humanities to come back into this equation. I mean, we did such a disservice by inventing the phrase STEM and leaving out all the humanities because we made it seem like STEM is the future when, in fact, it's not about science, technology, engineering, math. It's about English and history, about the things that make us human. So what we need is a design ethic born of technology that says, let technology solve the hard problems that it's good at. Fine. But let's preserve for humans the most important thing about humanity, which is our social interactions with one another. Let's not subtract that away just because we can. There is a real opportunity as a result of the changes that are happening for us to put powerful new tools into the hands of citizens to make transformative decisions about how they protect themselves, their health, and their communities. But to get there, we will need to focus on how this technology is created with some kind of social conscience, how it is put to use not to kill us or to manipulate us, but to enhance our social structures and community structures and the ideas that give us life. 